it is interesting because the next speaker is going to be answering the design question that, uh, w well, rather the issue of visualizing what blockchain and the network society is going to be from a design point of view. So uh, let's, let me have on stage Leandro Gro, who will teach us about the design of the network society. Thank you, Cosimo. Okay. So we'll have a beautiful day completely, uh, let's say, look in the future, a future, and also in some way being a little bit far from the everyday life that we spent all the day, all the time in our offices, in bank, in design firm like that. So my presentation is in this sense probably closer to the how, not to the what, but how. So this is the same group Italia. My name is Leandro Gro. Um, well, I actually spent all my professional life around the digital, and usually I landed. I say that I landed on Internet of Things in 2008, more or less. Um, the speech is about network thinking, and I would like to share with you this presentation, uh, splitting, splitting the story in three chapters. Let's say. First of all, I would like to agree with all of you about what is design. Well, for sure, in my personal opinion, design it is not just shape and pixel. We have great example of companies all over the world that become rich and super big because they trusted this sentence. This is not just about shape and pixel. Design is actually more a process that helps you to discover the meaning of the things that you do every day. And it is every time exploration. It's an exploration about the users, the contest, who you are in terms of the company that is producing a product and service. And yes, it is full of humanity and beauty all over the time. We can agree to do something that is ugly. And yes, design is also obviously a process. Design thinking, for example, is a process that has the goal to find the desirability, the feasibility and viability in an, any product and service. And recently, the business and the money in general discovered this true love for design. Make me laugh, it's the true love. <laughs> and well, there is a reason behind uh, probably this is the reason that may explain us why a center uh, acquired Fjord or why McKinsey acquired the Lunar and all the other big acquisition that we saw recently in the last three, four years in this area. Or perhaps because the design thinking, because the process behind the word design, people like design, money like design, because design may be good to uh, reinsuring the companies. Design thinking is reinsuring companies since the previous millennium. And well, this process are step-by-step -step path that lead you in some way to a pretty good result. Also, if the talent that you have, it is not actually enough, the process help a lot. And probably design may be loved by money because this idea of becoming predictable, predictable, what usually it is totally uncertain. Well, I have a personal idea about the why, about money and business in this moment is loving design firm and design in general, and is about the cultural shift that we are living. This guy was already mentioned before uh, in the morning. This is Peter Diamandis. And this is exactly the sentence that was already on stage uh, in the word of another speaker. And it is every time that you take a service, a business, and infuse the digital inside, this start to accelerate, start to follow the more law, start to be faster than your expectation. And well, it's, we have many, many examples, and typically the one is mentioned is Kodak that invent the digital camera. So shape a world where everyone love to take tons of pictures every day and failed, failed in his own paradise, where they are the inventor 
And they have people that love to take pictures. So that's as crazy, but because they doesn't got the digital shift. And well, digital technology are pushing everyone and everything to be closer to what I call consumerization and multiply touch points. Consumerization, it is what you see, for example, when you just use your iPhone. There is no the military vision version or, or the professional version of the iPhone. There are technology that might be possible to be sustainable just because they go straight to the consumers. And obviously the connectivity is what changed everything. Well, this is very simple. It's not a discussion to the level, to the cultural level that we already have in, during the day, but connectivity changed actually everything. It is not just decentralization. There is another word that I love, that is interdependence. And well, interdependence, it's uh, super effective in shaping the behavior of people that are actually using a specific technology. And all the consequences that we saw and, and we take from the market when we do our research are about humans. So the social induction, the influence that social network are having on us, it, be, it come from here. And the internet of things, it is, let's say, a bridge between physical and digital that is like uh, permitting that the power of the internet reach humanity. Not everywhere. It is not a problem of place. It's humanity. It's about us. So one of the sentences that many times, uh, let's say, take the attention of our customer is when we say that every time that you place an object, let's say in the universe, in the world of a consumer, of the person that is your consumer, your customer, well, you start an always own and personal and bi-directional dialogue with them. This is super powerful. In a world in which we fight through the advertising or whatever other to get the attention of people, these kind of tools may be potentially uh, very relevant and obviously might not be conceived with the, with the, let's say, the approach of those that just design advertising. This works as every technology works just if it is acceptable and useful. And my personal opinion is that designers in this moment has the opportunity to lead innovation because we have a little bit of hybrid approach. We love technology, but it's, this is not just our life. Technology is not what drives us all the way. We love talking about the service and business model, but making money is not the only, let's say, goal that we have. So this hybrid approach might be useful in many, many times. I have a short story that I would like to show you with you about what is behind this pressure network thinking that is the title of the presentation. This is a picture shot in 2008 when I started a company that was my first company about the Internet of Things. We started in California and was too early, it was a failure. This is not a success story, this is a failure story. We just started too early. And well, for many years later this company was gone I was, uh, let's say, invited by big corporation to give advices about the Internet of Things. And for years, I was believing that the reason why they asked me was because I failed before. I got the opportunity to, to learn before them. I was convinced that this school, what was, it was selling them. But actually was not true. Because the story still going on and companies still asking me like eight years later, which advantage I got in a few years working on the Internet of Things in 2008? It doesn't make any sense. So my personal answer about why this company is still involving us in the project is because we have a different mental model. In the same way in which in previous age, the mental model that shapes organization, product, and communities was like copied by some specific situation, like the clock, like uh, the assembly line, or like the, how the broadcast work, 
Well, this is the technology that is to influence our mental models. And we now are shaped by the internet, by the network. And there is something potentially dangerous that is happening now because also digital natives doesn't have a clear idea about that because they don't live 100% in the network as those that, let's say, grew up together with the net, passing from the forum to the chat to the web to all the stuff. Much people just live inside a vertical, inside the silos. I don't want to say Facebook is too old right now, but silos, just watching all the time just one side of the net. Network thinking, again, is a mental model. And what we need are like new skills, new way to see the problem. And for sure, we need an attitude that is typically from the, let's say, the design skills. So curiosity, lateral thinking, all this stuff. But we should have the ability to flow with the complexity. Complexity is a scary word. And having the ability just to tolerate they're inserting, it is mandatory to, to fill completely the power of the network thinking. And obviously, networks are maps that are very difficult to browse. And finding patterns and find leverage points is an ability that we the experience we need to uh, develop. It is a continuous discussion between us, our mental models, and the cognitive tools that we have. And about the cognitive tool, there is the second part of the story. Connected objects are natural born storytellers. People's expectations are actually shaped by consumer technologies. And most relevant than the what, what we design, what we use, is the when. What is the moment in time? We live on the border between I don't want to mention cloud. I want to mention fog computing in the IoT era. And today, what is relevant for any technology to live long and prosper is to be connected. This is like a Darwinian issue. We can do it without this approach. Oh, well, we already saw many stats and numbers about the growing of the Internet of Things, but just to Recall a few of that. In 2008, already the number of connected objects exceeded the number of humans on Earth. And in the last quarter of 2014, well, more iPhones were sold than babies born. This is one of the ways that I prefer to tell this part of the story, because again, it's about humans. So technology are shaping us through the connected and cognitive object device that we are using. And it's like an alien invasion. It's a world where every second more than 100 objects land in our pocket, in our car, in our desk. And all these objects are talking objects, are connected and tell stories to us. Let me do a few examples. Who is taking this picture? Well, as a human, I decide to take a picture and I click the button. Later, what happened actually is that the system double check if, I, if the target is smiling, if the eyes are open, and had the location, and had metadata. And let's say that most of the job, when we use a smartphone actually, is made by them. And I would like also to ask why we are taking a picture. Why she is taking the picture? S selfies. <laughs> is an habit that don't make any sense without a specific technology with the front camera that we learn and to use. This is like an inception. This is a, an inducing need. And I like to recall George Basala that say we are the consequence of the tools that we use. These guys there are shaping us. And well, we saw many, many applications talking about picture that change uh, dramatically in real time what exactly we record. And the question, what is real or who is the artist, I think makes sense. Who is the artist? Probably the algorithm in Instagram. 
And these are just very basic examples, very low level examples about memories that are co created between machine and human. But what is uh, uh, more relevant are automatic memories in autonomous stories that we start to see on the net. The first step of automatic memory, memories are, for example, collecting data. With or without your willing, your phone is tracking you continuously. And these data are available to do something. For example, something that helps you to stay in shape or, for example, to track your activity during the sport. But later, this data is shown to you in a specific way. This is like an automatic and visual mathematical language. The way in which I see the result is influencing me. I am my dashboard, and I would like to be better than what the dashboard is in this moment visualizing, the story of me that is telling. Uh, recently, I just saw how some kind of Android just try without asking proactively to assemble picture in a panorama. So these two pictures are taken and immediately he proposed me the panorama. I never asked for a panorama, but he does continuously the job to search if there is some match shot by shot and collect information. And we can do similar things, for example, with the iPhone building trialers about our vacation picture and whatever. And I was shocked last summer because one of my, uh, let's say, old parents, uh, related no parents, started to use this functionality to tell us the story, what we do, what they do. So this is something that is actually influencing our memory. And well, this is just the simplest object that was impossible to mention, the camera. Try to imagine what it's doing right now as a consequence of our usage, our smartphone, our embedded RFID, our self-driving car, and whatever we will use, for example, to protect ourselves. For example, this is a robot that protects uh, our garage for cars. And what will happen when Jibo will launch the first companion robot that answer to the voice control? So connected objects are not robot storyteller, and meaningful stories might be created combining the right level of automatic contribution from the machine, and what? Our habits. So brands, brands, any kind of brands is becoming, for example, a media company. I, I like when Tim O'Reilly said, um, in the near future, all the company will be, at, every company will be a um, technology company. It is true, but there is a step in the middle that is becoming a media company. So telling stories is super, super relevant for everyone. And people interaction with technology might seem predictable or predictable enough, but it's almost never true. This is something that we all learned through the experiment that Google does a few months ago, where rolling hills have been transformed into giant birds and villages' house have become cars and trucks. So this is the scary nightmare. Um, well, storytelling objects are already influencing all the machine. And the classic user interaction, so the interface that we know and we use since yesterday, are evolving in a sort of continuous conversation. We have tons of paper that were predicting that, and now it is happening. And, well, the incoming communication will be a relationship where the object emerged from the fog. And again, I would like to use this word of fog computing instead of cloud, because the way in which the intelligence is spread in this other kind of architecture. And just, um, let's say, a knot for all of us. I would like to remember what Kevin Kelly say about the technology. Remember that technology wants exactly what life wants, to be another species, perhaps. And last stop in this talk is about the design rules. So what we can do actually tomorrow morning to shape the kind of world that we like to have. So again, we saw that design, it is not about shape, it is not about pixel, so it's, it's about behaviors. And right now, 
what we can do is trying to set the intelligence in the right place in the architecture of any product and service. Trying to make systems that are partially, partially able to predict the user needs according to the contest. This might look complicated, but at the end, what we do, for example, as a design firm is, first of all, try to evolve our design tools. We have design tools, like the one from Design Thinking, and we are trying to evolve that to evidence the emerging behavior that already are present in any object. And later we will see, we will try also to infuse behaviors in other objects. This is, for example, a very simple scheme that we use to talk about technology regardless of any specification, of any buzzword, of any, I don't know, word that usually we use. How many megapixels? How many memories? How fast is the processor? Who cares? We talk about technology that are passive, reactive, or proactive. And behind this definition, we have notion about memory, interaction, recognition, and learning. We try to shift the language from a machine language to a human-like language. Also, we're still talking about technology, still talking about object. And the consequence of this approach is that, for example, we can have Canvas, is a design tool, that are totally different than usual. We can uh, put, for example, the intelligence of the system or the engagement in a chart together with the longevity. And, well, I have ton of examples of this use. Uh, for example, this is, if you play something here, with a very high level of engagement, a very low longevity, is probably you are talking about an object that is produced by a marketing campaign driven company. While, for example, if you talk about objects that are very long longevity and zero engagement, are, you are probably talking an object that came from a company that is technology and operation driven. We use the kind, this kind of tools to discover what our customer really want and to design the next level. And again, without mention the specific technology. These are other charts, for example, brand adherence and customer engagement. We use that in spaces. Which kind of technology you want to introduce in, I don't know, in the Prada store? Prada is about luxury. You can just place a couple of large display and pretend that the people like it. Well, in later, before we understand where the emergent behaviors are, and later we develop instruments and tools to try to infuse this behavioral thinking in object. And well, we have three very small law, like the three robotics law <laughs> from Asimov that is there on the left. The first is every object must know stories. Different kind of stories according to the complexity of the product and service. But for example, the history of the past, how it's made. This is very close to the Bruce Sterling vision of spine. And later, every object must be sentient. For example, we saw in a few years the GPS in the car emergence, emergent and disappeared because now it's totally embedded in our phone. But what is actually different between the two services? Well, one is connected and has a sensor. So the traditional, always, um, let's say, in a single uh, shape GPS, the one that probably all of us uh, bought, um, I don't know, 10 years ago, is like a, a, a mystical object. They actually doesn't know anything about the real world. It doesn't have any sensor. It's like uh, a preacher with a sort of god in the sky, that is the satellite, and with a clock. Nothing else must be sentient, must have a sort of direct knowledge of the world. We as a human develop our intelligence through many steps, including, for example, direct manipulation. But first of all, we have a direct experience of the world. Last but not least, every object must be social. I don't want to necessarily say that the object should post on Facebook. Who cares? But the, the object must be produce data that are meaningful for human that might be shared 
in a social network that we as humans are actually using. I don't believe, for example, in simple machine-to-machine -machine solution that never touch the human in all the value chain. I just don't agree. It doesn't scale. It doesn't survive to the network society. So my personal conclusion, technology acceleration change everything. Consumerization is one of the big force in the market right now. This as a consequence as the proliferization of digital touch point. And this is good because of our product and service, of our business in general, as a new landscape of a service opportunity. And consumerization evolve consumer habits. Consumerization is about consumers in people as pet behavior, not functionality. This is the biggest reason why I usually don't agree when the leadership of a project in any scale is just technical. And obviously to be connected is a natural state of mind for any object right now. And again, this is just to recall, placing an object in the pocket, in the car, or over the desktop to a consumer, to the person that is your consumer, means to build this personal, bidirectional, always on communication channel. Last but not least, the aesthetic as a role. We don't want to, to carry with us ugly stuff in the future. I think aesthetic as a role, but not just a flat aesthetic, just shape. The aesthetic of trust. We should be able to transmit our brand, our value, the meaning of the thing that they are doing to this path, a study of trust. And well, you know, every object should no story, be sentence, and be social. And that's all. We have a white paper that is free for download about that. Thank you, Lee. And um, we do have time for a few questions, and I see raised hands. Hi, Leandro. Joe, uh, that's such a fantastic presentation. One thing I love about it is that I, as someone who has lived in Northern and Southern California, you just gave the best talk I ever heard to integrate <laughs> Northern California, which makes objects, hardware and software, and Southern California, which makes stories in the form of movies and TV shows. And I think you should come to California because maybe we can have a more united business culture than the one we have right now, which is like Athens and Sparta. <laughs> well, you usually don't, don't met me because uh, I, I travel often to the North California, but who knows, perhaps in the future. <laughs> Great. So my question is, can we apply this for a second to the question of the Apple car? Mm -hmm. So Apple has its, uh, um, its strengths. And now Tesla has done a great job and has a car that has broke the scale, 103 points and 100 point scale and so on. How can Apple use principles that you've talked about today to have something new and to bring something amazing into the market? Can you show us like a real time example well, of how you apply this? I was scared, scared by you because you usually do very, very bad questions, very hard to answer, but this time, just for this time, I have the answer. Well, that's because you're a genius at the subject. <laughs> hey, and by the way, he might be referring, I talked to the top Italian scientist at the expo, and he was talking about how great Italian food products were, and I said, I decided to have some fun, and I said, I like to eat pizza and pasta and Italian cheeses all the time. I want to eat only those things. Give me the scientific evidence that that's healthy. <laughs> and he went, uh, uh, and the British top scientist tried to help him and say, well, the gentleman is asking for the benefits of the Mediterranean diet, which isn't <laughs> what I said, but he still couldn't answer. So, Well, first of all, Apple is trying to bridge the technology that they provide to the consumer in many different ways. Uh, from, the user interface, from the user interface to the kind of pointer that you use, the kind of interaction that you use, to Siri, for example, that is this last tentative to close the distance between the users and their own product. Where you spot this kind of approach in Tesla? Tesla, still a car. It is the beautiful, the most beautiful car that I can imagine. I want to buy one, but obviously I have just a little problem with time. <laughs> and <laughs> time. <laughs> Money. <laughs> And 
let's say that I have to work a couple of years <laughs> time in order to get a Tesla, but I am not able to spot the attitude that Apple, uh, that Apple has in trying to bridge the distance between the technology and the humans. So for example, I can imagine that just uh, going closer to the Apple car, who knows what the Apple car will be, I can just go there and say, hey Siri, bring me a Tom. That is a little bit closer in the human, let's say machine, human intelligence, artificial intelligence uh, relation than what Tesla is trying to do in this moment. And I can imagine that Apple, it is not just uh, finished the evolution of human computer interaction with Siri. They just bought three or four different deep learning companies in the last six months. So I think that making the system of the Apple car being able to be aware of the contest and let's say able enough to predict what the user needs will get the goal that they will try to reach. Thanks. I was lucky, Papa. Alex, because I was present eight years ago in Topics here in Torino to the prototype startup uh, <laughs> presentation of Leander. So, Leandro, about this, this startup, exists something similar to your idea of eight years ago on the market, I mean? Oh, wow. This looks pretty personal. Um, in 2008, we started a company that was, let's say, visually enough about... Uh, making the IoT possible through a protocol that is called OpenSpine. What's called OpenSpine? Spine come from Bruce Sterling. We choose the, game, the name together with, with him. So we mentioned Bruce Sterling as a, like a godfather of our startup. And the protocol was, let's say, something completely open, a little bit like blockchain sometimes, that allow you to identify specific objects in the net. And one of the features that were possible with this protocol is like, you lost your glasses and you asked the net where they are in the physical space. In the other object, peering your question, my red tribe something. This is, was the real basis of the technology. And what was totally different than what I'm observing today on the market is that everything was based on parallel computing. We're still using sequential uh, programming language in a multi-core universe. No one of us has a single core computing computer. Each laptop has more than one core. But we don't be able, we never moved to new patterning of computation that allow us to address all the core in the same moment. So we are not correctly using the computational power that we have. So I never spot something similar probably for a reason, uh, I don't know, uh, probably we should wait another 10 years to see, some, to see something similar, but also because technology, it becomes so cheap that who cares about being efficient right now? Okay, so thank you, thank you, Lee.